This video was sponsored by ExpressVPN. Hey, happy Friday. This week I have finally decoded Huawei's marketing BS and I can explain to you what Harmony OS actually is. AMD announced their first collaboration with Samsung on Exynos chips officially and Google decided to copy some of iOS's best privacy practices. Our weekly tech knowledge quiz this week is all about software and computer hardware. It's a pretty technical one with 20 brand new questions. So test your tech knowledge. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week have to start with the new Pixel Buds A series. The first sort of budget Pixel Buds coming in at just under a hundred bucks that look pretty promising. Then we have three new Bugatti smartwatches that are running an unspecified OS and are actually made by an Austrian company called Vita and cost 900 bucks each love me an expensive rebrand. And finally, the new MatePad tablets, which Huawei claims now run Harmony OS. More on that later, but the most interesting part to me was how the MatePad 11 actually uses a Snapdragon 865 Plus chip. Probably the first prominent use of a Qualcomm chip by Huawei in a very long time. Note that this is the last high-end non-5G chip Qualcomm made, and Huawei is only banned from buying 5G equipment, so that is probably why they could sell this to Huawei and it's an interesting way for Huawei to temporarily get around some of their chip shortages. And the community pick this week with the most upvotes in the crowd app was the Samsung Galaxy Tab S7 FE, which exactly as the name would imply is a cheaper version of Samsung's flagship tablet. There were a ton more new releases this week so check them out in the crowd app if you haven't already and keep uploading your favorites to help me pick the community favorites for next week. Links are in the description. Okay, and my first story of the week will have to be Huawei finally officially launching Harmony OS and saying that it is coming to over a hundred Huawei phones, tablets, watches, and more. And I was initially confused for hours trying to figure out what Harmony OS actually is. Huawei is very confusing with that. And I realized at the end that I was confused because Huawei is calling three separate distinct things Harmony OS, one of which isn't even an operating system. Okay, so first, there is an actual new operating system called Harmony OS developed by Huawei, which comes with its own microkernel and everything. This is new and unique in the same way that Google's Fuchsia, for example, is new and unique, but Huawei is intentionally hiding what devices this OS actually runs on. Maybe some Huawei TVs, maybe some IoT devices, but certainly not phones or watches. Then, second, Huawei also calls its fancy connected device ecosystem Harmony OS. And by ecosystem, I mean basically a slightly more powerful version of Samsung's SmartThings, or a little bit like Apple's HomeKit maybe. So it's basically Bluetooth, NFC, and a bunch of smart connection stuff and controls bundled together into a seamless package. How could such an ecosystem be classified as an operating system, I hear you ask? And I don't know, I don't think it can be, but Huawei insists on calling this a distributed operating system that runs across multiple devices and calls this distributed operating system Harmony OS. And finally, they also renamed the operating system of any device that supports Huawei's fancy new ecosystem as Harmony OS as well. That includes phones and tablets, which continue to run Android forks just like before. They have the Linux kernel, most of the same Android bits as before, and even the Android Q Easter egg apparently. But it also includes watches, which run an updated version of the same real-time operating system Huawei has had for years called LightOS. And it includes whatever operating system Huawei uses on their other devices like TVs and even earbuds. These devices obviously run completely different operating systems but because they all support the new connectivity layer from Huawei's new ecosystem, Harmony OS, Huawei says they in turn all run Harmony OS as well. What? Slapping the same name on these three distinct things is kind of like Samsung waking up one day and deciding to take One UI, their Android skin, Tizen, their own operating system running on their TVs, and Wear OS running on their watches soon, and claiming that they now all run SmartThings OS because they can all connect to the SmartThings cloud, then simultaneously insisting that this is all somehow a single distributed OS called SmartThings. 
That is obviously some high level marketing BS, but I actually think that the ecosystem that Huawei is building here actually looks pretty smart and quite interesting. So first, the connection and authentication between these devices should be simpler with a new UI that lets the user just drag and drop devices to each other or tap them together with NFC and have them quickly pair. Once they are synced, there is a new mini app platform called Atomic Services. This is basically like SmartThings Quick Actions and Android Instant Apps having a baby. So these mini apps don't require installation and they can do simple static things like show you text and images and offer toggles. So for example, to set up a new smart device, you don't have to install its app, but instead you just tap the NFC and it can load a tiny UI that shows you a few toggles and a bunch of content like recipes, for example. That's cool. And the innovation here is that since these don't actually have to be installed, the ecosystem can instantly drop the atomic services, including theoretically the context that you're in, over between these devices too. And on top of that, the devices in the ecosystem can also use each other as inputs and outputs. So on your phone, for example, you can select any of your connected speakers as outputs for any audio that you're playing, and you can cast content to your smart TVs, for example, kind of like Apple AirPlay, but they also showed a demo where you could hook multiple phones together, and from the camera app, you could use the recordings of the other phones as inputs inside your camera app. Now, most of these capabilities are also available on other platforms through things like HomeKit or AirPlay or SmartThings. So it's not like a completely revolutionary idea, but theoretically the connections here should be more seamless and just slightly more powerful with Huawei. It also seems like Huawei's Android fork on their tablets and phones is moving further and further away from vanilla Android with each update. They are ripping out some bits and adding in others. So it might in a few years end up being some Something unique on its own, I guess, but until then, this is just an Android fork with a mustache and fake glasses on. Now, I don't quite understand why Huawei is trying to convince people that Harmony OS is something that it clearly isn't, but messaging aside, I actually think that the software ecosystem that they're building here is quite interesting, and I think at least in China, it could become a pretty big success. Apparently, other phone makers have already signed up and are trying it on their own devices as well. So if you'd like me to make a big tech altar video on it, analyzing this topic, then let me know down in the comments. Okay, my second story will be a super short one, and it is AMD finally giving us our first details of their upcoming collaboration with Samsung on new Exynos chips. So at Computex, they announced that the next flagship Exynos mobile SoCs will use AMD's RDNA2 architecture, enabling high-end features like ray tracing and variable rate shading. Fancy. Now, details beyond that are kind of scarce, aside from the fact that Samsung will apparently launch the chip later this year. And while things like variable rate shading aren't exactly new to mobile GPUs, I mean, the Snapdragon 888 has it, for example, this is still pretty exciting news. See, most Android chips more or less use the ARM reference designs for their GPUs, so standard Mali GPUs. The exception here is Qualcomm, whose Snapdragon chips use their custom-designed Adreno GPUs, which is one of the main reasons why they have typically historically outperformed Exynos and MediaTek and other competitors. Fun fact, Qualcomm originally got their GPU tech from AMD as well, which is why Adreno is just an anagram of Radeon. Anyway, with AMD now back in the mobile business, we will see some proper competition on the GPU front, hopefully, and especially with rumors that these Exynos chips will make it to Windows as well, to power Windows on ARM devices, I'm pretty excited. And my third story of the week will be Google announcing that they will soon allow users to choose not to let apps access their advertising ID on Android. So without that, one app maker couldn't easily connect your activity in their app with your activity in another app just based on the phone that you use. You might remember that Apple introduced this in iOS not long ago, which caused them to have a big fight with big advertisers like Facebook, who rely on this ID to track you across apps. So this looks like Google Google's reaction to that. Now, it's unclear whether Google will implement a similar pop-up as Apple did, where users have to choose whether they want to allow the tracking or not, or if the users would actually have to individually find this setting somewhere deep inside the Android settings. But either way, pretty cool. 
Same as with Apple though, this is great for privacy on the one hand, you don't want everyone to know everything that you do in all of the apps, but also same as with Apple, this might end up being somewhat of an anti-competitive move as well, as Google might still allow itself to track you anyway with the OS level privileges that it has. We'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, with lots of new privacy controls coming in Android 12 and now this, it is clear that Google is feeling the privacy pressure from Apple and now has decided to react. Alright, and now enough of the news, it's the weekend, it's time to relax and that means it's time to watch some shows. And if you find that your streaming service, like Netflix for example, doesn't have a show that you want, chances are they do, just not in your region. So at times like these I like to check online what country that show is available in, then I flip a switch on ExpressVPN and within seconds I have the show. Then because it's the weekend I want another one so I flip the switch again and I have a new show. Having ExpressVPN is like instantly adding a ton of content to the services you already pay for and I use it for a lot of other things as well, like circumventing restrictions on company websites that insist on showing me only regional info during research for example. ExpressVPN is super fast so you will basically not even notice it being on, you can connect up to 5 devices to it simultaneously and it doesn't keep any locks on you. They are also regularly audited by external companies so you can be sure that your activity is private. Using expressvpn.com slash Friday checkout will get three extra months for free so check them out at the link in the description and I'll see you next Friday.